Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, cryptocurrency, fintech, cannabis, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Hello, my beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. Welcome to our 134th episode. It's such a pleasure to spend my time with you on the airwaves. Thank you for listening and interacting with me over and over again on social media. That truly does make it all worthwhile. I reply to each one of those questions and comments. Please make sure to follow me at Zen Sams. That's Zen with an X, not a Z. X-E-N. You can make sure to follow us all over social media, Instagram, LinkedIn, X, and even most importantly, Facebook for all you baby boomers, or you might be following me on Instagram. Make sure to also tune in Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern. All episodes of A Moment of Zen are streaming 24-7 on Kathy Ireland's Your Home TV. And of course, you can also find us on our YouTube channel at Zen Sam's. We have such a great show lined up for you. A big shout out to our newest sponsors, CO2 Lift and Once Upon a Coconut. In our Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, we're featuring Jordan Taylor, a luxury real estate consultant and philanthropist bridging the worlds of properties and purpose from L.A. to New York City. Beyond her real estate prowess, Jordan is the heart and soul behind 12 Months of Giving. Today, she's here to chat social activism, real estate, and she's going to talk to us about her partnership with Once Upon a Coconut and how they're revolutionizing the beverage industry. In our Going Deep segment, brought to you by CO2 Lift, today, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're featuring breast cancer previvor Stephanie Germino an influencer, an AFC advocate, medically known as aesthetic flat closure. It's a procedure involving the reconstruction of a flat chest. Today, she joins me to chat breast cancer awareness, aesthetic flat closures, double mastectomies, and BRCA gene mutations. In our Millennial Mom segment brought to you by OGPay.com, today we're featuring Shai Albrecht an American fitness trainer and influencer sharing the nuances of Jewish life, all while speaking up for women in Jewish law. She joins me today to chat about the ongoing Palestinian-Israeli crisis, what it was like getting unexpectedly stuck in Israel with her two kids and husband as the war was unfolding before their eyes. And she's also going to help me demystify stigmas surrounding Jewish traditions. Stay tuned for our Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, featuring the awesome Jordan Taylor. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, 100% pure coconut water. Imagine a drink that's nutrient-rich, powerfully refreshing, naturally sweet with no added sugars, not from concentrate, zero additives, low in calories, absolutely no artificial flavors, and is so tasty that it will become your new favorite beverage. Enter Once Upon a Coconut, the absolute best-tasting coconut water you will ever try. Available in four refreshing flavors, pure chocolate, pineapple, and sparkling with energy. Do your taste buds a favor and pick up some today at onceuponacoconut.com. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up next in our Hydration with Heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, we're featuring the incredible Jordan Taylor. She's a luxury real estate consultant and philanthropist, bridging the worlds of properties and purpose from Los Angeles to New York City. With a sharp eye for design, Jordan also curates living spaces that blend functionality with style, creating dream homes for her clients. Now, beyond her real estate prowess, Jordan is the heart and soul behind 12 Months of Giving. It's a nonprofit she founded. This initiative spotlights global foundations and movements driving positive change. Her unique ability to seamlessly merge her love for design and her dedication to philanthropy sets her apart, making her a transformative force both in the world of luxury real estate and social impact. Today, she's here to chat social activism, real estate, and talk to us about her partnership with Once Upon a Coconut and how they're revolutionizing the beverage industry. Welcoming now to the show is the amazing Jordan Taylor. Welcome, superstar. Hi, Zen. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thank you so much for coming on. Now let's jump right to it. Could you tell us more about your journey in becoming a luxury real estate consultant and a philanthropist and what really inspired you to, bri to bridge these two worlds of properties and purpose? Yeah, of course. So um, I started real estate about seven, eight years ago uh, here in New York City. And I was just kind of good at it. I was finding amazing properties for my friends and my family and uh, decided to kind of monetize on that. And um, I jumped into the luxury world straight away. And from there, there's kind of a natural lead into, I mean, there's a lot of money that flows around with real estate and a lot of money that kind of just sees no purpose. So for me, I was like, where can I channel one, my own commissions? And then also just a lot of the money that my higher end clients just have laying around. So uh, during the pandemic, I started a nonprofit called 12 Months of Giving, where every month we highlight a new uh, challenge the world is kind of going through and that so and someone or some organization that's already doing the work to change that or to empower someone or to, to fix a problem in the world. And so um, it was very easy to kind of funnel my clientele and my black book into this world of giving. And I'm, I couldn't be happier with how that all worked out. It's amazing how there are no coincidences. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. And I think real estate requires a lot of intuition because you now you have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and channel what they love and what they want and what that space means to Absolutely. them. So you are, you are an intuitive and that's why you're good at this. Now, 12 months of giving is what we're talking about. It's your nonprofit initiative and you really spotlight global foundations and movements like you just said, but can you share some of the most impactful moments or projects that have emerged from the initiative? Sure. Um, you know, I took a year off as I, so I moved to LA for a bit and now I'm moving back and settling back to New York. So it's been about a year since we've really focused in on it. But uh, in the previous year, one of my favorite months is always when we team up with, um, it's more so individuals who have been wrongfully accused of crime and we kind of hear their stories. And, you know, a friend of mine was locked up for now 19 years before uh, they finally, yeah, it's insane. Uh, they finally um, cleared her of the charges, but that's a really important one that we've decided to do every single year. So every year we also make sure that we team up with Be The Match. So they were to work a lot with blood cancers, um, we do drives with them. We do online kind of uh, collaboration with them to make sure that their mission gets out and we get as many people uh, filtered into their to their system as possible. So they're also a wonderful uh, worldwide group that does amazing work. It's so important to give back and it's so important to, to identify how we will continue to give back, not only to each other, but to the world. And these are two incredible, incredible causes that you just brought up. So kudos to you for doing that. Yeah. Now let's talk about your partnership with Once Upon a Coconut. Can you explain the unique aspect of this collaboration and how you feel they're revolutionizing the beverage industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have known um, the Once Upon a Coconut guys for many years. I want to say maybe six or seven years now. And they have always struck me as people that genuinely just have great hearts and they've come up with this product that not only, you know, is one of my favorite things to keep stocked in my kitchen, but they, it's important to me that they do have a purpose and they do have a message behind such a, such a unique brand. Um, so it was kind of a no brainer for me to team up with them and hydrate myself and hydrate the hearts of others. Um, and I can't wait to see what they, what they end up doing with the brand. I think this is just the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yeah. They are going big places. And I know for a fact that they 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 scoured the earth for a very specific type of coconut water and it landed them in Vietnam. Now, the world's sixth largest producer producer of coconuts is Vietnam. And coconut over there is a form of religion. And this dates back to 1960s, where people worship and consume nothing but coconuts. Specifically, this region has insanely delicious tasting coconuts. Uh, but this particular brand has zero additives. It's so low in calories absolutely no artificial flavors, which is a big stickler for me. And it, and it, and listen, it doesn't feel like a mind blowing taste palette because of everything I just said, right? Zero additives, no sugar added, but it totally is. And I could personally vouch for this brand. I specifically love the chocolate. I don't know what you, I, the pineapple and the chocolate are my favorites. What flavors do you love? I love the OG. I think the flavors just speak perfectly to you. And, and you're right. Like it doesn't sound like it would be, and I'm sure people have tried other coconut waters. It is a world above the rest, without a doubt. 
yeah and so tell me what do you believe sets them apart from other brands other other than the taste um how does it align with your values and goals in the world of social impact because they are extremely active they are they are and i think that they're very vocal about that um i think for me it's they're very um they have a clear they have very clear branding so they make it very clear to their consumers you know how sustainable they've been how um you know, they've, they've really sourced their product in a responsible way. And I haven't seen that from other brands. And I think that since the beginning, um, the guys at Once Upon a Coconut have made sure that people are at the front of their conversations. And so, you know, their sourcing has been pretty, pretty impressive. Without a doubt, like sustainability and environmental consciousness, you just said it, are increasingly important in the beverage industry. Absolutely. And Once Upon a Coconut incorporates these values into its products and practices, which is game changer for me. But, you know, it's one thing to introduce premium coconut water that tastes better than anything else, better better than anything I've ever tried before. But it's truly something else to give back, like you said, to the communities and people that truly need it. And that's why for every case of Once Upon a Coconut sold, they donate 10% to a charity that they select each month, which is so important and aligns with exactly the yes. ethos of everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, how do you balance your career in luxury real estate with your dedication to philanthropy? And are there any principles or strategies you follow to seamlessly merge these two areas of your life? Um, yeah, I mean, it's actually quite easy to kind of do the both. Um, with real estate, I got into real estate because it allows me to have more of a fluid uh, a schedule. But I mean, instead of working a nine to five, I'm kind of working 24-7 but I've, I've integrated the two. So for me, you know, it, it, it's only natural for me to have these conversations with people now and bring up the nonprofit right at the beginning. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's, they get to know me a, a bit deeper, which I think is very important. I consider real estate, you kind of, you kind of are matchmaking, you know, you're matchmaking a person with a home or, or a person with an apartment or a family with an apartment. So for me, I think it's important for them to get to know their matchmakers. So the nonprofit is a huge part of my life and my personality. And I do find that, you know, 99% of the time we stay on that and, you know, the real estate comes second and we find really cool ways to collaborate together or for them to get involved. And because we have 12 different uh, nonprofits every year, there's always something, if not several things that get them, uh, that get them interested and kind of, kind of float their boat a little bit. And then we can kind of dive a little deeper into one specific cause. Boy, you have such a great roadmap. I, this is fantastic that you've incorporated <laughs> giving back, balancing it all, making money, doing what you love, and really just being in charge of your own self. I love everything you're doing. Yes. Now, you have a sharp eye, a really sharp eye for design uh, in your real estate work. How does your approach to design and aesthetics translate into creating dream homes for your clients? So it's kind of a new addition to my real estate consulting that I've added in. I've I've been familiar with design forever. My mother's incredibly good at it. Uh, I just never really had the confidence to kind of do it for people that were paying me. So in the last, <laughs> yeah, I would do it for all my friends, myself. Like I always had the funnest apartments, but it was the first time, you know, just a couple of years ago, it was the first time I, I was finally given the platform by a client, now really great friend of mine. They handed me a credit card and they said, I don't want to know what you're doing get in there. I just want to see your vision. And it, it unlocked something for me. So it's kind of my MO now. I, I prefer like leave. I mean, let's, let's collaborate on this, on your ideas and, and, and help me out here, but I want you to leave for a week and come back to, you know, the home of your dreams. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, as you said earlier, I'm, a, I'm an intuitive person. I, it's what makes me so good at real estate as well. I can hear what you're saying you want, but a lot of times people don't know how to articulate what it is exactly they want. So I'm good at kind of reading between the lines and then also getting to know you enough to know what is going to be the most functional and aesthetically pleasing for you, um, despite or in spite of what you say. Boy, you have your work cut out for you because there's a <laughs> lot, there's a lot of psychology that goes into all of this. Oh yeah. But I, but the, the story of when you got handed that credit card and they said, run with it. That's, that was the beginning because oh, yeah. that's somebody else putting so much faith into not just you and your work, but into the process and allows you to put that seal of approval that says, Hey, I am worth it. Hey, this is a business. And it really does take that first client. And then the rest is a domino effect. So I'm glad that's you found right. that person. Yeah. Now, what, what advice do you have for individuals looking to make 
a really meaningful impact. Okay, both in the in the real estate industry, but and the realm of social activism. They want to kind of mimic your behavior. Where should they start? Um, so for me, I kind of had to jump up because this all happened for me during the pandemic. I think we were all in this state of helplessness with everything going on. Um, I was kind of scrolling through social media and and was hit by a, a video that just tugged on every heartstring I had. And um from there, I kind of took a deep dive into that specific cause, which was be the match. It was a, it was a, the video was a kid who was suffering from a pain moment during um, his sickle cell. So it got me right in the heart. So I think what's important is for people to kind of find what it is that really speaks to them and what, what would really ground them to, to a purpose and from there build their life kind of around that. So I was given that opportunity to, you know, I had nothing but time and, and, people around me. I was back in my hometown. So my girlfriends from high school all wanted to get involved. And so I got to surround myself, not with, not with people who wanted a job or not with people, people who wanted to just give back and wanted to spend their time doing that. So I would say, find your purpose in terms of like, find what really speaks to you, build your knowledge around that, and then build your circle around that. Um, and then from there, be open, be a bit fluid as to where it want to takes you. There was a moment where we tried to make this a little bit more corporate and it just, it stifled us. And so I would say, let your passion move the way it needs to move um, and help who needs to be helped along the way. And don't let kind of the, the technical next steps get in the way for you. So what you're saying is let, let the universe guide you. Absolutely. And you did just that. Well, we are at the end of time. Thank you so much. You are so, so inspiring. And you're doing such a great job at social activism, giving back and, and at streamlining your business in such a beautiful way. And I love it that you are a female trailblazer in your field. Thank you, Zen. I appreciate it. This has been wonderful. That was our hydration with heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut. That was the incredible Jordan Taylor. She's a luxury real estate consultant and philanthropist bridging the worlds of properties and purpose from LA to New York City. You can definitely check her out at 12monthsofgiving.org. That's 12mog.org. You could head directly on the gram and find her at Jordan Taylor now or at 12 months of giving. That was our hydration with heart segment brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut. Now imagine a drink that's nutrient rich, powerfully refreshing, naturally sweet with no added sugars, not from concentrate, zero additives, low in calories, absolutely no artificial flavors, and is so tasty that it will become your new favorite beverage. Well, enter Once Upon a Coconut. It's the absolute best tasting coconut water you will ever try. It's available in four refreshing flavors. You could go with pure chocolate, pineapple, and sparkling with energy. But do your taste buds a favor and pick some up today. Head to onceuponacoconut.com. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A moment of Zen is brought to you by Once Upon a Coconut, 100% pure coconut water. Imagine a drink that's nutrient rich, powerfully refreshing, naturally sweet with no added sugars, not from concentrate, zero additives, low in calories, absolutely no artificial flavors, and is so tasty that it will become your new favorite beverage. Enter Once Upon a Coconut, the absolute best tasting coconut water you will ever try. Available in four refreshing flavors, pure, chocolate, pineapple, and sparkling with energy. Do your taste buds a favor and pick up some today at onceuponacoconut.com. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation, or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions such as OGPay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OGPay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. Welcome back, beautiful tri-state area. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in just a few minutes in our Millennial Mom segment brought to you by OGPay.com. Today, we're featuring Shai Albrecht, an American fitness trainer and influencer sharing the nuances of Jewish life, all while speaking up for women in Jewish law. She joins me today to chat about the ongoing Palestinian-Israeli crisis, what it was like getting unexpectedly stuck in Israel with her two kids and husband as the war was unfolding, and demystify the stigmas surrounding Jewish traditions. 
Now, a little backstory. The Hamas terrorist attack on Israel, October 7th, comes amidst the backdrop of a long-standing history of conflict over land and independence that has plagued the region. The Balfour Declaration, issued by the British government in 1917, announced Britain's promise for a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, which then under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. The promise appeased the Zionist movement, who believe in a Jewish right to the land of Jerusalem, or Zion. Following the end of World War I, the region of Palestine was conceded by the Ottoman Empire and was placed under the rule of the British via mandate from the League of Nations. The mandate was criticized for not taking into account the wants and needs of the Palestinians who resided in the land and wanted independence. Palestinians refused to recognize the resolution. A violent conflict between two groups continued. Today, Israel and Hamas are at war after the Palestinian militant group launched surprise cross-border raids from Gaza, killing more than 2,000 people and taking hostages. In response, Israel has been pounding the territory, strikes with Palestinian authorities, saying they left thousands upon thousands dead. Many in already cramped and impoverished territory are in dire need of aid currently. There are fears this crisis will eventually escalate, drawing in Israel's neighbors. Here to chat more is my expert at hand. And welcoming now to the show is the incredible Shai Albrecht. Welcome to the show, superstar. Thank you so much for having me on your show. So excited that I can chat with you. You are an expert in Jewish law. You communicate with your community. You debunk myths. You're on the front lines, literally ended up on the front line. Can you share with us how, well, let's start, how you got started as a fitness trainer and influencer while also focusing on advocating for women in Jewish law and what inspired you to combine these interests? And then we'll head back to how you got stuck in Israel. Yes. So um, my fitness journey really began like many fitness journeys. I was in middle school. I was devastated about how my body looked. And I started to, you know, I realized that it was my responsibility on, you know, how I move, how I eat, which is going to define how my body looks and feels. And um that's how my fitness journey began. And I have been spreading the light of health and wellness to everybody that I know. And funny enough, um, my I started speaking about Jewish law because there was a video that my husband and I did together. And my husband is also an Orthodox Jew, so he wears a kippah. And when I train, I always wear regular fitness clothing. And that video started to go viral. And I was, I was like so surprised. I didn't really understand what happened. And I messaged somebody that had reshared my video. And I said, excuse me, can you please explain why people are going crazy over this video? And he was an Israeli man. And he said, oh, it's just so strange to see a Haredi Jew. And he was talking about my husband and like an unaffiliated woman together. And I was like, unaffiliated? What? Like, I'm also Orthodox. And then that's when my eyes were op like open to this reality that if you don't look Orthodox, you just are not Orthodox. Wow, that is insane. <laughs> that, that just Okay, so there you go, demystifying stigma number one. Yeah. So you, you've been vocal about your experiences uh, related to Jewish life and tradition. Can you tell us more about, the, we'll talk about the nuances per se, you've encountered, separate to this one, in your journey and how you've managed to demystify the stigma surrounding Jewish traditions? Yes. So people are obsessed with, in order to be an Orthodox Jew, you have to look a certain way. And the truth is that Orthodoxy or Judaism it has almost nothing to do with what you look like. It's a it's an ideology that teaches people how to live a healthy and beautiful life. And, you know, I'll give you an example of, you know, one of the mitzvot, which is like a Jewish commandment that we have, is Shabbat, which is a day of rest, 25 hours where we fully, you know, we stop working, there's no electricity, we don't do anything. And, um, you know, the corresponding mental health benefit for Shabbat is that so many people are stuck in 
in a reality where their production is who they are, right? I am shy and I'm proud to be shy because I'm a personal trainer. But God is saying, no, no, it's not your production that makes who you are. You have worth without your production. And that is the mental health purpose of Shabbat. Like stop doing everything that you think matters and you think is who you are and realize that your worth is just you being alive, being here. And so that is the message I'm trying to convey, that it's not what I wear. It's that's the least, least of, you know, Judaism's, you know, hopes for the Jewish people. Yeah, it's definitely not what you wear. Um, okay, cut to for 2023. And now we have this incursion against Israel by terrorist group Hamas. Uh, we know that at least 1,600 people have died and 3,600 others have been injured um, after the militant group Hamas launched an incursion on October 7th. So <clears throat> Hamas fired thousands of rockets towards Israel and an estimated 1,000 fighters crossed into the country from the neighboring Gaza Strip. And of course, Israeli officials, as we know now, have said that in that original moment, at least 200 civilians and soldiers had been taken hostage approximately. We have Israeli forces now that have responded, declaring, of course, a state of war. And you, my dear, decided to go and take a trip, unbeknownst to you that this was going to happen. You packed up, you left America with your kids and husband and landed in Israel, could you describe your experience of being unexpectedly stuck with your two kids as the war was unfolding and what emotions and challenges did you face during that period? Well, let's start with how beyond excited I was to go to Israel. I have not been in Israel since my husband and I got engaged. I haven't been there in 13 years. I was physically giddy, okay? It was like an adult child in a candy store. I was telling everybody I met that I was going to Israel. My children were going to see Israel for the first time. It was honestly a magical experience and moment. And we got to Israel before the holiday. We were in Jerusalem. We then went down south and saw the south and the beauty that's there. We then came back to Jerusalem. And on October 7th, that morning, we woke up to a sound we have never, ever heard before. And, you know, I'm probably going to get emotional talking about what's going on. But, you know, we, we woke up. And we were listening out. We were so confused. We were like, this is not a fire alarm. But I, you know, I'm from America. What alarm is this? And my son runs into our room and he says, it's a fire alarm. Everyone's in the stairwell. Come, come. So we jump out of bed and immediately it clicks. And we're like, this is not a fire alarm. And we run into the stairwell and we have two out of three of our children. And we didn't know where the third child was. I wasn't sure if she was, you know, with my parents or had gone somewhere else. And there was like moments that we were in the stairwell holding our children and just freaking out about where our other child was. And this is how our trip ended slash the second half of our trip started. Yeah. Wow. So what less i mean a lot happened a lot of a lot of emotions to to process there but what lessons did you learn from your time in israel during the crisis and how did it shape your perspective on the current palestinian israeli conflict so what i learned is that there are real people there real people like you and me and they have children you know i have a cousin that lives there and she has four children and she won't leave her apartment. She is so petrified. She doesn't want to go to the grocery store. She thinks that, you know, a terrorist is going to come out of any, you know, corner or a bush. And this is the way, you know, almost 8 million Jews in Israel are feeling right now. And it was just so eye-opening to feel that same feeling. We only hear about it, you know, in news and in radio shows. And it's something that you, it's palpable when you're there. You taste, you know, everyone's fear. You you are shaking when you hear the siren. It, the, the terror 
that the terrorists have done is so much more than physical. It's psychological for every single Jewish Israeli and Jew around the world. It's un unbelievable. They definitely instilled fear. Uh, that they did effectively. Uh, my eight-year-old daughter said to me, mom, um, how would they find me if, uh, if they, don't, they don't have, how would they know I'm Jewish? And, and she's like talking about the terrorists. And I said, um, I guess they wouldn't know other than your name. And she goes, can I have your name? And my heart broke. And I was like, no, I was like, you can't. Your last name is Feinstein and you're going to stand proud behind your last name. And she was like, but am I safe? And I was like, no one's really safe, but we're going to do our best to keep you safe in this world. I said, whether your last name is Feinstein or Smith or Jane or Doe, this is the world we live in today. So I said, you stand proud behind your name, but you're right. It, it happened. They did it very effectively and very quickly. And it was a ripple effect, but we can only stand strong. Now, um, can you share some of the, I guess, key messages or insights you've shared regarding the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and how these discussions have impacted your audience and followers and how you're handling that conversation? Yeah. Um, one of the most prevailing Jewish, you know, ideology is that human life matters. Um, every single human life matters. One of the first mitzvot, which is like commandments that we have is pru uruvu, which is, you know, be fruitful and multiply. Judaism is all about living and life and the value of life. And, um, Unfortunately, unfortunately, there is evil in this world and they are really looking to do atrocious things, you know, as we've seen in the past, you know, in Nazi Germany, there is real illness that needs to be condemned. So as an influencer, Shai, what responsibilities do you feel in terms of using your platform to address sensitive and complex topics like this conflict? How do you navigate the potential backlash and criticism? So I have to use my platform for good. I have to use my platform to inform the people around me, you know, of what is really happening. Um, I have to use my platform in expressing, you know, that all humanity should condemn, you know, the genocide of any people and every people. You know, we are living in the 21st century. This, this should not be happening. This cannot be happening right now. And, you know, I have a ton of support from my followers. And of course, there are always people that will slide into my DMs. And the truth is, my heart really goes out to those people. Because I'm going to make the assumption that they have been indoctrinated since childhood. You know, I've seen some of these videos of, you know, Hamas members going to little children and saying, you know, who are we going to kill? The Jews. You know, these are evil, awful people that have, you know, done terrible things to us. And if that's the way I was raised, you know, I would hope, I would really hope that I could learn a little bit more and see a different side. But as most people do, they don't do that. And so my heart bleeds for them when they come at me and they say things that don't even make sense. There's no logic. There's no coherence. Um, I just, I feel- It's ignorance. It's ignorance. I'm going to shift gears a little bit to traditionally what your social media page is all about and how you uh, became an influencer and how your videos have gone viral simply based on just who you are, what you teach. Now, backwards, extreme, judgmental, sexist. These words are often the ones that come to mind when people think of Orthodox Jews and Judaism. And scandals 
that reinforce these associations hit the papers often, and public opinion is at best uneducated about, about Orthodox Jews and Judaism, and at worst, intolerant of them and their philosophy. So even more troubling, there's a sizable minority of people who were raised Orthodox but had bad experiences due to unhealthy un upbringings and poor education who just feel as negative as the criticism from without. What... Uh, in your perspective, this is your community, this is who you speak to. What is, in, in the context of the ongoing crisis in the world, how do you balance your advocacy for Jewish women, uh, for women in Jewish law per se, with your views on peace and co conflict resolution with what's going on in the world today? Yeah. So I am a big believer in Judaism and the philosophy of Judaism and not in the, I'd like to say, most insignificant part of Judaism, which is, you know, what you what a woman wears, how a woman acts. Um, you know, I've spoken about Judaism really being an ideology of, you know, a healthy lifestyle, how to live with purpose. And I would say the same thing for, you know, the Palestinian people that are living in Gaza and they're being ruled by Hamas, which, you know, it's a group that will murder you if you're gay. It's a group that will, you know, put women in jail if they aren't covered up enough. It's a group that, you know, teaches little children that murder is a positive thing. And if you die, like you've done something great. And I think that's how, you know, these two just connect well. You do a good job at, at, drawing the two parallels because at the same time if you look at it bird's eye view we're all we're all asking for the same thing just peace love integrity having a, a place that everyone could belong and coexist amicably but unfortunately it's the women and the children at the front lines as casualty and the real victims are the children here on both sides because palace the palestine is 50 percent children and so yeah they, this is clear as day that Hamas set out to do damage, to incite fear, terror, uh, with their barbaric, uh, just intolerable acts, and a good population of the world fell for it. It's mind-boggling to see. Now, um, what projects, we're going to shift to positivity now, what projects or initiatives, I know you're always involved in something amazing in your community, are you involved in or you're planning to tackle the challenges and misconceptions surrounding Jewish tradition? Um, how are you going to continue your movement? So right now, one of the projects, right when everything happened, I got an inflow of messages that were just saying, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And I knew that my community needed and wanted to help so badly. So the first thing that my husband and I did is we made a GoFundMe and I've held the money and I wanted to make sure that we do the right thing with this money, every single penny. And um, we decided that the best place for the donations to go is going to be the rebuilding of the, you know, Moshavs and communities that have been absolutely destroyed by Hamas and yeah, just awful, awful things, you know, I can parents losing children and people being taken hostage. And, you know, we want to rebuild. We, we hope to, you know, give them some relief from the atrocities. Well, we're going to direct as much attention to your page as possible. So on your social media handle at Shai Albrecht, that's where you have your goal, the GoFundMe link for donations. Yes. Okay, yeah. well, we are definitely going to be sending lots of traffic your way, sharing that link. We're going to do our best to make sure that your voice is heard and not silenced, and you have a friend in us. It's so kind. Thank you, really. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me. Got it. That was our Millennial Mom segment brought to you by OGPay.com. That was the incredible Shai Albrecht. You can check her out directly on the gram at Shai Albrecht. I'll spell it out for you. S-H-A-I-A-L-B-R-E-C-H-T. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this.
A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions such as OG Pay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OG Pay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by CO2 Lift. As we age, our skin loses moisture and elasticity, causing wrinkled skin. You can reverse this aging process with CO2 Lift. CO2 Lift utilizes the powerful benefits of carbon dioxide to lift, tighten, and regenerate your skin. This simple, painless at home carboxy therapy treatment is scientifically proven to reverse the aging process. You will see reduction in wrinkles, increase in luminosity, and improve pigmentation, sagging, skin tone, and radiance. For more information or to order CO2 Lift, go to CO2 Lift. Lift.com. Welcome back, beautiful Tri-State area. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Coming up in our Going Deep segment brought to you by CO2Lift.com. Today, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're featuring breast cancer provider Stephanie Germino, an influencer and an AFC advocate medically known as aesthetic flat closure. It's a procedure involving the reconstruction of a flat chest. Extra skin, fat, and tissue in the breast are removed, and the remaining tissue is tightened and smoothed so the chest wall appears flat. Now, this mama from Florida underwent a double mastectomy when she was told there was a mutation in her BRCA1 gene, which meant she had an 87% risk of developing breast cancer. Now, normally the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes protect women from getting certain cancers, but some mutations in those genes prevent them from working properly. So that if you inherit one of these mutations, you're more likely to get breast cancer, ovarian, and other cancers. Now, in a bid to avoid getting the deadly illness, Stephanie made the brave decision to undergo a double mastectomy where both breasts were removed and she even refused a reconstruction. She boasts more than 1.5 million followers on TikTok. She's dubbed as the boobless babe and uses social media to share her story, raise awareness of the procedure and detail her newfound freedom. Today, she joins me to chat breast cancer awareness, aesthetic flat closures, double mastectomies, and BRCA gene mutations. Welcoming now to the show is the incredible Stephanie. Welcome back, Stunner. Hi, Zen. Thank you for having me. You are amazing. You look so good, so refreshed from the last time I interviewed you, and you are the perfect person to help me kick this off. So Breast Cancer Awareness Month is a significant time for raising awareness, yet many people may not be familiar with the term previvor. Could you explain what it means and how it relates to your experience? Yeah, absolutely. So everybody knows survivor, but previvor is when you have some type of either genetic mutation or any predisposition to getting uh, anything such as breast cancer. You know, BRCA1 mutation unfortunately leads to a lot of breast cancer. There are a lot of other genetic mutations as well that can heighten your risk for breast cancer. But for me, previvor meant, you know, my BRCA1 mutation put me at a higher risk of getting breast cancer in my life. Just like you said, 87% chance of getting breast cancer in my life. It's insane that we are in the year 2023 going into 2024, and we don't even have better detection for this because I think it's really just about proper screening and detecting and catching this earlier on. But breast cancer is the most common cancer in women in the United States, except for skin cancers. It's about 30% or one in three of all new female cancers each year. And the American Cancer Society estimates for breast cancer in the United States for 2023, we clocked in at about 300,000 new cases of inv of invasive breast cancer that are going to be diagnosed in women and it and the numbers are staggering and breast cancer of course we have to say mainly occurs in middle-aged and older women the medium age uh the time of breast cancer diagnosis is typically 62 but we are seeing younger and younger women get diagnosed which is really scary now when you were told there was a mutation in your BRCA1 gene um you did you consider any other alternatives before choosing the prophylactic double mastectomy. And can you tell us more about aesthetic flat closures and why it was an important option for you? Yeah, absolutely. So 
when I found out that I had the potential risk of being BRCA positive, I was about 18 years old. My mom had just found out she was positive. She underwent her double mastectomy and her hysterectomy, just as her sister did. And now mind you, my mother at the time was in her late forties, early fifties. So she was around that time of pre-menopause. So getting a hysterectomy already wouldn't have affected her as much as it would have affected me at my age when I did get my double mastectomy at 27. And the reason why I got my um, double mastectomy was just for my peace of mind. My cousin, for example, she is BRCA positive as well. And she did the advanced screening. She waited. She hasn't gotten her double mastectomy yet. And she is my age as well. She is 20. Uh, she's now 30 years old. We're both 30. And you know, there are definitely different avenues to go when you are BRCA positive. You don't have to do any you know, preventative surgery if you don't want to. You can do more increased screenings. You can do hormone therapy. You can just you know, let it be and take your risk. And a lot of people, I get that, you know, oh, you only had only had an 87% chance. Why would you chop off healthy breasts? And my reasoning is just because my mother's mother, my maternal grandmother actually had breast cancer due to having this gene. If it wasn't for her and us not having any, you know, person in my family actually being affected by breast cancer, I don't think that I would have gone the prophylactic route. But the fact that she did at such a young age, you know, I believe she was in her 60s when she did actually get her breast cancer diagnosis and they actually came back twice. And so seeing that, and mind you, my, my grandmother is an immigrant. So I only say that because she wasn't raised here in America where we have so much processed foods. She does, she wasn't raised here, which I think is a big, you know, leading contributor and all of these stuff that are carcinogenic to us that we don't realize. I think that that is such a big, um, contributor to the high, the rising risk of breast cancer. But with that being said, she was still so young to get her breast cancer diagnosis, not once, but twice. And thank God she, she beat it. But when my mom and her sister got diagnosed with the BRCA mutation, because that's what led to my grandmother's um, diagnosis, they both took their prophylactic double mastectomy and hysterectomy with stride. And at the time, again, I was 18 years old. My mother let me know of my possible risk because if one parent is BRCA positive, that means you have a 50% chance. And I just want to, you know, insert here, it's not just the mother that can have the mutation, the father can too. And that's what happened in my cousin's case. Her father, my mother's brother, was actually the BRCA carrier. And so he passed it down to my cousin, which is the one that did the hormone replacement and did the preventative screenings and all of that measure. Me on my case, I just, I had lumps in my in my armpits that were cysts. And you know, that could happen to anybody, build up a hair follicle, sweat, um, at the time, deodorant with the aluminum and all of that. And then around my period, I would get fibroids in my breasts, which again, be in the society is deemed normal. You know, and for me, if I didn't have the BRCA, uh, the chance of being BRCA positive, I think I would have just passed it. Right. You know, I wouldn't have thought about it. But knowing yeah. in the back of my head since I was 18 that this was a potential risk, uh, it started building up. And doctors would say, you know, wait until you're done with your childbearing years. And so I just, I didn't take it seriously, you know. And the entire time from 18 up until 26, 27, I believed, okay, yeah, I'll get my double mastectomy if I'm positive and I will get reconstruction. And that was my mindset for about eight years. Okay, let's talk about that reconstruction. So, and it's important to note that prophylactic mastectomy can lower breast cancer risk by 90% or more, but it doesn't guarantee that you won't get breast right. cancer. And this is because it's not possible to remove all breast cells, even with a mastectomy. Uh, the breast cells that are left behind might still go on to become um, cancerous. Now, you opted against reconstruction. So tell me what factors shaped your decision. And can you recommend resources or an organization for individuals who want to learn more about aesthetic flat closures or connect with the breast cancer previvor community? Yeah, absolutely. So just like you said, uh, getting a double mastectomy doesn't completely lower my risk. It just pretty much took it from 87 to 0.7, where the average uh, woman with breast is only at like a 7% chance. However, there is breast tissue in your neck, there is breast tissue in your collarbones, in your armpits, in your sides. That's why they can't get it completely out. 
But I decided not to get reconstruction. And again, for eight years, I believed I was going to get reconstruction. I was going to go that route and get implants put in. But it wasn't until like a month prior to my surgery that my fiance and I sat down and she had a conversation with me and just, you know, kind of really brought common sense to the table for me was that I, you know, at 27 year, years old, I'm going to do this preventative surgery that would potentially lower my risk significantly of getting breast cancer. And a lot of our friends at the time were experiencing what's called breast implant illness. And whether you believe in it or not, I've physically seen it that there is a perfectly for all intents and purposes, healthy individual uh, who cannot explain why they're experiencing so many different symptoms and different ailments. And then the moment they get their implants out, all of those ailments go away almost immediately. Or yeah. there, there has been in the breast cancer community, unfortunately, implants that have been recalled because they lead to cancer, to breast cancer. You know, there is just so much out there that we don't know about these foreign objects putting into our body. And I was, you know, the reason I was going to get implants for me was just a very vain reason. You know, growing up, I didn't really love my boobs. Um, and so I was just like, oh, I'll just get them done, redone or whatever. And I very ignorant thinking is a free boob job. And I know that that's one of the worst things you can say in the breast cancer community now. But with me in that mindset, like, okay, yeah, breast implant illness is a thing. And then I started thinking about the reconstruction I've seen after a double mastectomy. It's not the same as getting implants with healthy breast tissue. Once you get your breast tissue removed and you put your implants in, it's really depending on if you go under the skin or not, it's really just, you know, getting skin tightened over these implants. And that's kind of the look you'll have. And that wasn't something that I started, you know, seeing for my body. Yeah. And then just also knowing not everybody has to get them maintained, but normally after every 10 years, you should get your implants maintained or so. And I was thinking, you know, I'm only 27 at the time. That means every 10 years, I'd have to get my implants maintained and or potentially get them maintained and i was like that seems like a lot of unnecessary surgeries so in an instant i thought okay i won't get implants i and then i was like you know i started thinking about it and i was scrolling through tiktok one day and i saw this woman on my screen and i will i won't lie i got i got the reaction that probably a lot of people who see me on social media get like shock and awe like i had never seen this before and it was a woman completely flat and my brain took a minute to, you know, kind of compute what was going on. And then I did my research. I looked at her story and I was like, oh my God, she and that, is And flat. that's what was perfect for you. Now, can you share some common misconceptions or stigmas surrounding aesthetic flat closures that you've encountered and how do you address them? So a lot of the time, what I get is right away when people see me and they automatically think I am a trans man. Uh, meaning that I am transitioning from being a woman to a man. And that's why I've cut off my breasts. And the thing is, is that in this society, I, I can't fault them because, you know, that is really the only thing that's being broadcast is top surgery. And what's sad is that top surgery, a lot of the times is more aesthetically pleasing than an aesthetic flat closure, you know, because they're not top when you're getting top surgery done, they're not worried about getting all the breast tissue out. They want to make more of like a peck like look for you. But with aesthetic flat closures after double mastectomy, they want to be as aggressive as possible with getting as much breast tissue out. So, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like they care so much much about what it looks like as long as you know medically and, and physically they've done what they could for you um, as far as removing your breast tissue and so unfortunately a lot of surgeons aren't versed enough in aesthetic flat closures and I do recommend going on not putting on a shirt.org to find surgeons that are you know versed in aesthetic flat closures because not everybody can do it unfortunately i've had to do a revision on my own and i'm looking to get another one done because it wasn't done by somebody who was versed in aesthetic flat closures i recommend going to the breasties they are an amazing group of individuals who not only can you find the pre-viver pre platform, survivor platforms, thriver platforms, care-viver platforms, because that's another thing there, but they are just such a, a good bank of knowledge for everything, you know, breast and gyno. You are a good related. bank of knowledge. You are the good <laughs> bank of knowledge. You are here like the encyclopedia. We have about a minute left. Let's talk about hateful comments. So you've been told 
uh, you, you just said it, right? Like a trans man, you're definitely a man. Where did your milkers go? Uh, you're going to hell. I even read on your page. Uh, no guy will yeah. want you. You've mutilated yourself. Uh, one guy said, this generation is effed up. No one wants to see this. And you, what do you say to haters? And what advice would you give to somebody looking to have a preventative double mastectomy? You know, it is hard because we are in a society that has these preconceived notions of what a female body should look like, that you should have uh, breasts. And you're right, I do every day get faced with the hatred in this world. And it's, you know, it's funny because when I inform them, even though all of my videos on my page inform them, when I inform them that this isn't a transitional situation, it's a breast cancer situation, they automatically kind of backpedal and like, oh, I'm so sorry, da, 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 da. but you still should cover up because you're a woman. And it's like, there is literally nothing there to cover. And I'm on social media to raise awareness. No, I'm not constantly, obviously topless every day, but social media, I have such a big reach that this needs to be more of a conversation because people like you automatically assume that right. everybody who doesn't have a, doesn't have boobs, is a man, which isn't the case. And it's unfortunate that a lot of my, you know, pre survivor, survivor, brother and sisters, when they have to lose their breasts, they have to be faced with this reality. And that's why some people do or are reluctant to get aesthetic flat closures and regret getting their implants. And that's why I show up here the way that I do is because I want people to know that it's okay to be, you know, completely yourself and do what you want for your body and not for anybody else. You're still beautiful. You're still confident. You know, Know, and I'm I'm trying to help as many people as I can. And I'm so grateful for all of the individuals who do reach out to me to tell me, you know, I'm the role model or that they take my picture to their surgeon and they're like, this is what I want. And like to see, you know, oh my God, I have older, older women reach out to me saying that they unfortunately had to battle breast cancer and they had to lose their breasts. And they're so grateful for my content because they haven't looked at themselves in over 30 years and they're, you know, they're not okay with it because they related to their femininity and I'm, you know, it breaks my heart, but I'm hoping that even the little drop of in the ocean that I make is enough to kind of help somebody else in my situation or even worse. You are amazing. And with that, we are out of time. That was incredible. You are, you just like didn't stop talking for 14 minutes straight and gave me every bit of information I've needed. And everyone that's going to hear this and see this interview is just for sure going to run to Instagram to follow you because you are so honest, so transparent. And more importantly, you're beautiful and gorgeous. And I can't believe you get the hateful comments that you do because you are legitimately a very, very good looking woman. And I can't imagine anybody doubting your femininity just because you don't have boobs. It's insane. So thank you so much for being you. Thank you so much for having me, Zen. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Guys, you definitely have to check her out. That was our Going Deep segment brought to you by CO2 Lift. That was the incredible Stephanie Germino, breast cancer previvor and AFC advocate. She goes under the handle, the boobless babe, two E's, the boobless babe. Now, guys, listen, if you're concerned about your breast cancer risk, talk to your healthcare provider. They can help you estimate your risk based on your age, your family history, and of course, other factors. And if you're at an increased risk, you might consider taking medicines that can help lower your risk, or in Stephanie's case, a double mastectomy. Your healthcare provider might also suggest you have more intensive screening for breast cancer, which might include starting screening at a younger age or having other tests in addition to mammography. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A moment of Zen is brought to you by CO2 Lift. As we age, our skin loses moisture and elasticity, causing wrinkled skin. You can reverse this aging process with CO2 Lift. CO2 Lift utilizes the powerful benefits of carbon dioxide to lift, tighten, and regenerate your skin. This simple, painless at home carboxy therapy treatment is scientifically proven to reverse the aging process. You will see reduction in wrinkles, increase in luminosity, and improve pigmentation, sagging, skin tone, and radiance. For more information or to order CO2 Lift, go to CO2 Lift. Hi, I'm Sari Katz with this week's beautiful segment for A Moment of Zen. Did you know that 47 million consumers nationwide are concerned about their skin quality and feel that their skin looks dull and lacks glow? Well, there's a brand new first of its kind product on the market in the U.S. called SkinVive by Allergan. SkinVive is a micro droplet injectable hyaluronic acid that goes into the deeper layers of the skin to help improve the skin quality for up to six months. How does it work? Well, it increases a protein called aquaporin-3 that helps upregulate 
the flow of water into and out of our cells to keep our skin looking hydrated and smooth. It helps with fine lines, pore size, skin redness, and the overall radiance of our skin. It also helps with shallow acne marks. So people are loving this product. It's good for anybody with any skin background at any time. And it is not a filler. It is not going to increase the size or volume of our tissues. So if you're interested in looking airbrushed and filtered all of the time, ask your provider about this internal moisturizer called Skin Vive. This is Sari Katz for a beautiful segment on A Moment of Zen. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Your Home TV. Hi, this is Kathy Ireland here on A Moment of Zen brought to you by Your Home TV. We've developed an all-inclusive subscription-free network that you're going to love, whether it's financial freedom, fashion, beauty, health and wellness, wonderful weddings, travel and culture, cooking, entertainment, and short-form documentaries, programming for everyone. Classic films and new shows, including Kathy Ireland Presents American Dreams. We've developed this network just for you. Please Please check out yourhometv.com. Tune in to A Moment of Zen, Saturday nights from 9 to 10 p.m. on WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. Well, that's a wrap, my dear friends. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio, every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Or you could head to 710wor.iheart.com forward slash a moment of zen. Also remember that we're live on Traverse TV Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern, YouTube Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern, and all episodes of A Moment of Zen are now on Kathy Ireland's Your Home TV streaming platform, streaming 24-7. You can head directly to our channel. That's free programming to you at mox.yourhometv.com. Thank you for listening to A Moment of Zen. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host. Thanks again to all of our sponsors that continue to make this show possible. And remember that happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it.